Okay, uh, thank you, Dan. Um, so welcome back, everyone. Um, at GMU and, and Mercatus, uh, we are committed to the idea of free and open discourse about fundamental issues in, in theory and in policy. And our ability to achieve that actually is uh, based on a very Hayekian insight. It's of human action, but not of human design, meaning the free flow of the discourse, the outcome of that is not of anyone's design, but it does require a lot of very key individuals and also the institutions within which that, that, that exists. And, and we're very fortunate here to have um, in attendance several of the people who are, are key at doing that, our department chairman, uh, former Dean uh, Manny, as for, well as former president Alan Merton, as well as the, the various different folks at Mercatus. And so I, I want them to understand how appreciative we are of creating the kind of environment which all of us benefit from uh, tremendously. Um, so today we're here uh, gathered to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the winning of the Nobel Prize for F.A. Hayek. Um, actually, his, uh, the announcement was made on October 9th, 1974, and his public was a public announcement. He made his speech, uh, was delivered on the 11th of December, 1974. And our goal is not limited uh, to retrospective, though we do believe that looking backwards is sometimes a vital prelude to a productive looking forward. Um, <coughs> We have asked today a distinguished group of scholars uh, this afternoon to examine and provide us with insights into the impact of Hayek's work on the research direction of other scholars in economics and in the field of political economy. Um, one of GMU's own uh, Nobel Prize winners, we're lucky to have the other one, um, uh, Jim Buchanan, the late James Buchanan, once remarked about Hayek, actually I, at a conference that was down at University of Miami Law School that Henry Manny put on, once remarked uh, about Hayek that uh, he deserved our scholarly and analytical respect uh, due to his opposition to aggregate demand management economics with his defense of the role of relative prices and the distortionary impact of the manipulation of money and credit has on an economic system. This is from Buchanan's talk. And also in his critique of socialist planning and his articulation of the communicative functions of the price system and the competitive market economy. But Buchanan also goes further and highlights Hayek's work in the philosophy of science, political theory, legal philosophy, and he argues that there should be an exemplary uh, to young scholars and worthy path to follow up for the next generation. In that essay, Buchanan also argues that the traditions of the law and economics tradition, the property rights tradition, the public choice tradition, and the Austrian tradition should not be viewed as traditions in conflict with one another, but that the future of political economy is in the combination of those traditions. And, and to a large extent, that kind of attitude that Buchanan had influenced the founding of the Center for the Study of Market Processes, which has metamorphosized over the years into the Market Process Center. It's kind of important to maybe step back and realize and with the miracle of modern technology, you can actually revisit this, is that Karen Vaughan, who is here, is one of the main people that established that center, uh, along with Rich Fink and others. Uh, one of the first speakers that they had to come in was F.A. Hayek. And so you can actually go online and watch a F.A. Hayek talk about three sources of human values at George Mason University. Uh, and just to President Merton, it was in a much smaller room and not as, not as elaborate as this, this room here. Okay, Hayek himself, as I mentioned in my earlier introductions, Hayek himself used the occasion of his Nobel lecture in an attempt to stimulate uh, future rather than celebrate his uh, future conversation rather than to celebrate his past scientific achievements. His, his lecture was titled The Pretense of Knowledge. And to those who have a passing knowledge of his life work, it could be excused if they interpret that title to be another occasion where he was actually uh, uh, sort of challenging the efficiency of government planning of the economy. But his lecture was actually addressed to a much deeper issue related to the nature of the discipline of economics itself and to macro public policy um, of that time, circa 1970s. He concluded that lecture by emphasizing the importance of the institutional framework within which economic activity takes place um, and the limits of economics ability, uh, the limits of economic, economists' ability to tinker with the details of that play of the economic game within the framework. As he wrote, and I'm going to quote from him, uh, if man is not to do more harm than good in his efforts to improve the social order, he will have to learn that in this, as in other fields where essential complexity of an organized kind prevails, he cannot acquire the full knowledge which would make mastery of the events possible. 
He will therefore have to use what knowledge he can achieve, not to shape the results as the craftsman shapes his handiwork, but rather to cultivate a growth by providing the appropriate environment. In this manner, uh, in the manner in which a gardener does for his plants. This is the danger and exuberant feeling over ever growing power with which advance in the physical sciences has engendered and which tempts man to try, dizzy with success, to use the characteristic phrase of early communism, to subject not, our, uh, not only our natural but also our human environment to the direct control of a human will. The recognition of the insur, insur well, and I'm gonna screw this up, so. Recognition of man's limits uh, to his knowledge uh, ought indeed to teach the student of society a lesson of humility, which should guard against him becoming an accomplice in man's fatal striving to control society, a striving which makes him not only a tyrant over his fellows, but which may well make him the destroyer of a civilization which no brain has designed, but which has grown from the free efforts of millions of individuals. So that's, Hayek, that's how Hayek chooses to end his Nobel Prize. It's an interesting factoid about the Nobel Prize is that he received the revise and resubmit uh, on it from Economica and he withdrew the paper and it wasn't published really in the journal until 1989 in the American Economic Review. Uh, uh, but uh, the reason was is that, uh, that uh, well, Hayek, no one wanted to publish what Hayek had to say about that stuff. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, I think we, over, I think Austrians overplay their outside of this to the mainstream too much, and, and you know, sort of the, what Kirzner was talking about in the quote that Buchanan has about the Austrians. But I do think it's quite amazing that he submitted this piece to Economica, which he was the editor of for many years, and uh, the uh, the editors wrote back and said, "We know that the occasion of the prize sometimes doesn't give you enough time to think all the way through your arguments." <laughs> um, so. Um, you can talk to Bruce Caldwell about these things if you would like. Um, anyway, uh, so Hayek, Hayek sought to provoke his fellow economists into rethinking the enterprise of the discipline. This is what we hope our talks today will stimulate, a conversation about the deep impact of Hayek's ideas and the new directions that they may be pursued, none of which know how we can orchestrate that, right? All we're trying to do is uh, uh, cultivate a conversation about these ideas and see where those ideas may go. Um, and so, in fact, what we care about most is the contestation of ideas and the free, free uh, examination of that. And, and we're very fortunate today to be joined by, uh, as I say, you know, sort of distinguished scholars. So we cannot ask for a more distinguished group of scholars to help us uh, with this intellectual journey that we hope to embark on. Now, I should say right up front, unfortunately, uh, Professor Phelps is ill, but he sent in his comments. So. I don't know how to do his accent, so but I will read his comments. So I'll try to do my best uh, imitation of him. No, I won't. I'll just read his comments. And uh, but uh, so I'm going to introduce him. I'm going to introduce the speakers first right now in mass, and then when they get up, we'll just have them go because you're going to want to hear them talk. So I'm going to try to. I apologize in advance. Uh, these gentlemen, obviously, they're the high. They received the highest prize. Um, and uh, prestige in our profession so we could go on for a very long time uh, with the resumes. I'm going to try to summarize it very quickly for, for everyone. So let me start with Edmund Phelps, won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2006. He, um, he's a McVicker Professor of Political Economy at Columbia University and Director of Columbia Center for, on Capitalism and Society. Um, in addition to his work that uh, forms the core of his scientific contributions. His most recent work is a work called Mash Flourishing. And it's about sort of the nature of a free society and the constant innovation that's required in that free society. And I highly recommend it to everyone. Um, and so, you know, Professor Phelps isn't here to push his book, but I will. Um, but it's an excellent, um, excellent discussion of the innovation society. His close colleague and friend, uh, you know, Bill Bommel, Right, as a book on the free market economy as the innovation machine um, and whatnot. And so this is the kind of work that he's working on now. Uh, Dr. Eric Maskin is the Adams University professor at Harvard University. He received the 2007 Nobel Prize um, in economics with uh, Leo Hurwitz and, and Roger Meyerson for laying the foundations of mechanism design theory. I told, uh, for those of you who are my graduate students at class, you know this, but not, I'm gonna be going and leaving to be a, uh, visit another university in a couple weeks so I'm gonna miss one of my graduate classes, but I didn't let him miss it 
What they're going to do is they actually have to have as a guest lecture Professor Maskin, but again, due to the modern technology, they get to watch a lecture of his on mechanism design theory that is now available, and then they have to, and I'm going to grade them on it. You better listen to it, so <laughs> they can't cheat. Um, so anyway, Professor Maskin is at the foundation of mechanism design theory. It's one of the main uh, sort of uh, ideas in economics. There's, uh, as far as I know, there's never really been a constant correspondence between mechanism design theory and public choice, especially the Buchanan-esque constitutional political economy, but yet there's obvious parallels between the two of them um, in the idea of designing the rule systems and aligning the incentives and, and meeting all of those ideas. And so there's a very strong idea of a connection to political economy. Um, before going back to, you know, to joining the faculty at Harvard, uh, this last recent time he was a professor at the Institute for Advanced Study uh, from 2000-2011. And then finally, Vernon Smith. Uh, Vernon Smith is a professor of economics and law at Chapman University, a research scholar for, the Inter Inter for ISIS Interdisciplinary Center for Economic Science um, here at George Mason University, a fellow of the Econometric Society, um, and uh, as well as many other centers. He's on the board of the Mercatus Center. Um, we were so fortunate to have him as a colleague with us here at George Mason for many years, and he's, uh, I will say this about, um, this is true of all the people that are in this position, but in my estimation, it's particularly true of Vernon Smith, is he's a lifelong learner. And one of the most amazing intellectual experiences anyone could ever have is to go to lunch with him because he might not talk to you about economics. He might be talking about the prehistory of man or some, the latest article in Nature or whatever, and it's a phenomenal experience, and we miss you. Vernon, every single day uh, from our intellectual environment here, but we're trying to strive with your example to be lifelong learners ourselves, um, and I think that's our, uh, our goal. All right, so I am going to start by reading Ned Phelps' uh, comments. They're short. Um, he got ill on a trip to China, and so that's what uh, derailed him here, um, but I will uh, try to read them fast. Um, why adulated by many, Friedrich Hayek is underestimated by the economics profession. In the minds of most scholars of economic thought, however, he is one of three pioneers of modern economics. Frank Knight John May and John Maynard Keynes and F.A. Hayek. Um, I will comment on some of Hayek's contributions. Uh, one, Hayek's early macroeconomics remain strange to most economists. Um, now, so he starts out by arguing that, he, that uh, Hayek believed that a decrease of thrift, a decrease in the supply of savings in Ramsey's terms, would be, uh, would be a contraction. Uh, in a recent co-authored paper, he's examined, Professor Phelps, the question in terms of a neo-Austrian non-monetary model. Um, he finds it's theoretically possible that an increase in the social dividend or a cut in the tax rate will have effects on expectations, future bonds, having the net effect of lowering present asset prices and thus lowering investment activity and employment. So he believes that in the most recent models that he's worked on in this co-author paper have in fact uh, captured aspects of Hayek's claim um, in, the, in the cycle. Um, but the brief implicit in early Hayek, if I'm not mistaken, is that a, a misjudgment that a rise in the capital stock would depress ap asset prices. Thus, employment is not easy to sustain, though his co-author, separate from him, has provided a model that shows that it's true. The problem, the problem is interest rates fall, which force the real price of capital to rise. This is what he's trying to model. Two, Hayek's criticisms of socialism, including Oscar Lange uh, and Abba Lerner, what they called market socialism, uh, Phelps argues is fundamental to our belief that uh, with a class or two of exceptions, resource allocation is best left to private enterprise, to the autonomy and initiative of private actors. Yet, he believes it is mistaken reading of his classic paper on the subject from the majority dating from the mid-30s to the 1948 on the use of knowledge to say that they argue that socialism cannot generate innovation and capitalism can. He was far, far from articulating such a thing. Hayek is all about what he explicitly called adaptations to changing circumstances in the economy or outside world. A business person is generally required to see and grasp new opportunities. So what he's arguing is related to Professor Kirzner's talk, which was all about the pure arbitrage opportunities 
He's arguing that there's something more that's fundamental to business, which is the grasping of new innovations, right, rather than recognizing just the price discrepancies. It is also a mistake to view the 1940s book, The Road to Serfdom, as a summary of his opposition to socialism. It is better to be seen as a warning to Britain not to adopt the corporativism that came up to grip Germany, Austria, and Italy in the 20s and 30s. Hayek was explicit that he did not oppose all government spending. For example, he favored investing in medical research aimed at extending human longevity. Keynes teased Hayek in his general, generally congratulatory letter, saying that his own list of sanctioned roles of the state was quite different. Mine are different from both. Okay, point three. Hayek's critique in Road was essentially that corporativist government blocks businesses from some avenues and even pushes them into other avenues. This insidious interference tends to grow until economic performance is seriously challenged, as in the 1930s. The concern is over economic efficiency, again, not innovation. This is the claim that he has about what he's drawn. So now this comes to his point where he relates to his own work. Uh, innovation is never explicitly uh, dealt with in Hayek's writings, to my knowledge. Yet he opens the door to it in his marvelous comment on Galbraith's uh, work, The Non Sequitur of the Dependence Effect. There, Hayek points out that the writing and widespread reading of novel books of C.P. Snow could not have been predicted. So, evidently, a market economy may manifest novelty. Hayek's theme, however, was, this, was the associated point. That is, there is radical uncertainty over products and whether such products will be adopted. This leads to my work in the past 10 years or so on conditions for innovation to be chronic and abundant and on its human value. Okay. The in indigenous innovation of a country is fueled by the people, this is now Phelps quoting himself in a speech. Um, the indigenous innovation of a country is fueled by the people's imagination and creativity. But the key step, this fuel has to be sparked by the dynamism in the economy, the desire of people to attempt innovation, people's capabilities at innovating, and the latitude society gives to innovators. If this dynamism runs wildly over the economy, pervading all or most industries, and if it runs deep down to the grassroots of the society, the forces of this dynamism will be powerful. The rewards of such economy are profound. The most valuable rewards are non-material. Workers are engaged in challenge. Careers become voyages of creation and discovery. Even for ordinary people, working life can be hugely meaningful. While we go on revering the great ideas of Hayek, as well as Knight and Keynes, we must get on with the task of building an economics that gives central place to innovation or the decline of it in determining practically everything we care about in the modern world. Okay, thank you.